we had a boss in TRADOC, RCG, a few years ago, uh, General Perkins, I mean, most people in the audience will remember General Perkins, you know, he led the Thunder Run to Baghdad. But one of his standard remarks when he would talk to audiences, particularly of uh, junior and mid-grade officers, was, well, the Army's not a boutique force. The U.S. Army does windows. We do whatever the, the U.S. government and our political leadership ask us to do. And oftentimes it's going to be those ugly, nasty, uh, small wars in uh, obscure places uh, that the rest of society may not all be all that interested in. Uh, but there's no one else to do it. It's us. So we don't opt out. We don't have the option of opting out and saying we only want to do one type of war. We do whatever type of war that the nation requires. Yeah, when we're talking about irregular warfare, it's important to, to keep in mind that uh, different cultures and different countries have different ideas about irregular warfare. And we see, for instance, uh, the tendency in Western doctrine and US doctrine is, is much driven by the military, but other countries, they perceive this more for the interagency and a whole of government per perspective. So I believe all military practitioners, both in the army and the joint force, should care about irregular warfare because it is absolutely instrumental to understanding those capabilities that reside across the joint force uh, that are perhaps more discreet, um, more precise, but also critical to shaping and preparing the environment uh, so that we can use the capabilities required to, to, to win in LISCO or in large-scale combat operations. Um, by achieving positional advantage before we have to fight. When people talk about the differences between regular and irregular warfare, well, the, the primary difference is that irregular warfare happens much more regularly than does regular warfare. And I think that is um, something that can be observed throughout history, but within the time span of, of you know, the post-World War II, the Cold War era, the post-Soviet era, uh, what we have observed is that uh, the great powers, uh, whether they be states or coalitions of states or alliances, are less willing to engage in conventional warfare, which is this violent struggle between states and coalitions with their conventional forces uh, because of the cost imposed. So the differences between irregular and conventional warfare, we kind of address in FM30. You have to talk about them uh, together, I think. Uh, to understand the differences. So there are complementary and reinforcing approaches to conflict. The joint definition and army definition of irregular warfare, joint coming from the August of 2023 joint publication, one volume one, joint war fighting. The army's definition coming from the October of 2022's FM30 multi-domain operations. They look very different, but there are a lot of similarities and they align well. The similarities that are worth noting are they both recognize that this is a form of warfare. They both recognize that it's conducted by states and non-state actors uh, and other groups. Uh, they both acknowledge that there are, there are specific approaches that you know, are part of conducting an irregular warfare uh, operation or activity. The Army talks about overt, covert, and clandestine methods. Well, that's everything. Uh, the joint approach talks specifically about um, indirect approaches asymmetric approaches and non-attributional approaches. So the what and the how are evident in both definitions very clearly. Probably the most important distinction is the why, which you get from the joint definition, which says these activities are conducted to assure partners and allies uh, or to coerce adversaries. And specifically it says to coerce or assure states and non-states and other, other groups. But really we're talking about assuring partner nations and allies, and coercing our adversaries or influencing their behavior. So the why, that gives us the context. That's the thing that helps us understand, is the, is the mission I'm conducting part of an irregular approach? Is it something that is intentionally or even unwittingly part of a campaign to build integrated deterrence and enduring advantage? I think when we look at the current definition of uh, irregular warfare, that the value of that definition lies in that there is a, a broad definition that actually accommodates irregular warfare and that uh, signals that we should really also prepare for irregular war. 
And I think one of the reasons for the, the new definition, the new focus on irregular warfare, is to try to get the United States thinking about how it might be able to use some capabilities below the level of armed conflict in order to secure our objectives, to build closer relationships with our partners and allies, to challenge our adversaries, and, and perhaps to deter our adversaries from deciding to escalate uh, up the spectrum of conflict. I think the important thing for practitioners to understand is that whether or not you're doing something that constitutes irregular warfare is a matter of context. So if we look at how the Joint Force defines irregular warfare, it is purposeful. It gives a why in its definition. And it is specifically to assure partners and allies or to coerce our adversaries or in order to create enduring advantage. And in the, in the interesting and sometimes backwards logic of irregular war, the very fact that we're really, really good at tank on tank, ship on ship, plane on plane, makes it more likely that our enemies won't fight us that way, that they'll fight us as terrorists and insurgents and assassins. And, and so I think it's very important that all officers, all national security professionals think hard about the chinks and the gaps in our armor and in the ways that our enemies are most likely to approach us, which is not necessarily the places where we're strongest and where we spend the most time and money preparing. They're gonna to try to hit us where we ain't. So why does strategic competition matter to us? Why is this a good starting point for understanding irregular warfare? Strategic competition is the idea that states uh, and other actors will compete um, outside of conflict, outside of crisis, for their various interests. And at some point, adversaries who have incompatible interests uh, may risk an armed conflict between each other. Uh, but strategic competition is this idea that we, you know, the, the joint force supports the United States whole of government effort to compete with our adversaries to maintain an enduring advantage in the international space. This is particularly important uh, at this very, very moment uh, because what we see now is that uh, our main rivals in competition, um, they are conducting irregular warfare. They are exploiting really the gray zone between war and peace. It's important for us to counter that, but also to operate in that uh, area ourselves. We should be able to counter our, uh, our rivals and uh, to some extent, uh, you need to operate as an irregular yourself because either you are uh, waging irregular activities or you are supporting an, a non-state actor or a proxy that's operating as an irregular actor. A war with uh, a China uh, or a Russia is almost immediately going to become a world war, right? Uh, they've got reach globally just like we have reach globally. And so we don't have uh, the ability to take them on with, with you know, divisions and cores everywhere that you know, a, a threat presents itself. So why wouldn't you use a regular warfare, for example, as an economy of force measure, as a way to uh, tie down their resources, to threaten their lines of communication, uh, to operate through allies and partners uh, on a more economical scale than perhaps the primary joint operations area might be. So if you look at the preponderance of what the military spends its time doing, it's not large scale combat operations, it's something else. And that's where this irregular diction comes in of, hey, this isn't the conventional big war that we're used to, this is something else. Um, and I think that's where we're, we're kind of going with the regular warfare. It's great, don't get me wrong, we need to prepare the joint force to go in and be you know, the biggest and baddest military in the world capable of any contingency operation. Um, but we also need to realize the chances of that large scale combat operation being global, um, nuclear and existential in nature is, is low. Um, but the chances the forces employed in you know, proxy wars or indirect wars or counterinsurgencies around the globe is pretty high. So I think irregular warfare has application across all five warfighting domains and can achieve effects in all three dimensions. Uh, so we're perfectly aligned with MDO doctrine in that regards when we're talking about irregular warfare. It is an all domain form of warfare and I think any irregular approach has to take that into consideration. The Joint Force has three objectives, three goals in the realm of strategic competition. And the first of those is to contribute to integrated deterrence, this idea that whole of government activities in strategic competition should have a deterrent effect uh, to our adversaries. 
the second goal is to inculcate this mindset of campaigning. That campaigning is not just something we do in conflict and major military campaigns, but it is also something that we should be practicing in competition. And it's this, this notion that there is a coherent, comprehensive approach to how we're applying the force, the joint force, uh, in all of these engagements around the world on a daily basis within the competition space. And then the third component, the third goal of the joint force in strategic competition is that we are contributing to a, an enduring advantage. All right, we're, we're building enduring advantage within the force itself, but we are also contributing to the enduring advantage of the nation with respect to our potential adversaries. I think the application of irregular warfare should, look, should be looked at through the lens of campaigning. As we consider the doctrine and the application of irregular operations and activities across the competition continuum and what the NDS uh, directs, I think you have to look, the, look at this through the lens of a campaign approach. Irregular warfare campaigning fundamentally is first and foremost, I think it has to be global. You, you have to be transregional. You have to think about the threat, uh, in this case, we can say the pacing threat of China, for example, as a global threat, one that requires the breakdown of GCC boundaries and the ability to walk and work across GCC boundaries and coordinate uh, activities and operations across boundaries. I think it has to be asymmetric in nature. It requires an ability uh, to be very precise and very discreet about the application of those operations and activities. Uh, but also to balance it with revealing certain capabilities to deter our adversaries. So this, this notion of campaigning, continuously campaigning, uh, I think is very, very critical as you, as you string operations and activities together for a defined end state, which I would argue is deterrence. What's important for the junior practitioner to appreciate about irregular warfare is, first of all, this, this serves purposes across the entire competition continuum from competition through crisis all the way into conflict. It may be, there may be an irregular campaign that is seeking to produce effects in and of itself, uh, but typically that sort of thing is not decisive. That is enabling either to strategic competition or to large scale military operations. Those are the thing, you know, strategic competition is, is trying to maintain an enduring advantage it's a desired state, it's not an end state. Whereas your, you know, your, your large scale military operations are decisive operations. They're intended to produce a military outcome in order to enable the political relationships that follow. And irregular warfare campaigns support those across the whole competition continuum. But I think that the definition was, was somewhat lacking because all warfare is about people. I mean, all warfare is about influencing people really. And it didn't really have a lot of relevance as we shifted um, from a focus on counterterrorism to a focus on great power competitions. I mean, look at how do you use irregular, how do you use irregular, you know, warfare activities or irregular techniques um, in competition with a great power? Come at this from a slightly different perspective in all domain warfare, the ability to gain human and information advantage to create opportunities in the physical dimension. We know that war is inherently human and the, the ability to affect and change behavior is absolutely critical. In competition, the ability to wage regular warfare against an adversary really fundamentally boils down to human and information advantage. And that human and information advantage uh, can create physical opportunities at a time and place of our choosing. If you look at irregular war, I think by nature that's multi-domain because it's not only about the military activity you're doing, the physical activity, it's also about the cognitive influence. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's an interesting component of how emerging technology can be used in regular warfare. Um, you know, if we agree whether using the joint definition or using the army definition, this is about the cognitive domain, the cognitive space, you know, whether it's influencing people or assuring you know, your, your partners or coercing your adversaries, we're trying to uh, conduct military activities that have that cognitive effect. You're trying to do something in, in the people's headspace. And I think technology is enabling that maybe more so um, than in the past. The, the conduct of conventional warfare by land forces has a, a th there's the potential for irregular approaches to benefit, to create the conditions, to, to even support convergence windows of opportunity for land forces by creating peripheral dilemma for the adversary. 
by conducting activities that enable access for the joint force, for the land forces, uh, that they wouldn't necessarily be able to create for themselves by progressing through a linear battlefield. But when you have irregular approaches, uh, of, you know, operations activities that are knitted together in a campaign in support of the joint force commander, uh, in support of a land force commander, then that can only benefit the conventional fight. I, I think that's good um, in that we've tried to narrow it a little bit and talk about, hey, you know, militaries do IW or, or warfighters do IW. But we can't lose sight of, hey, if you do an IW campaign in and of itself in the military, then you're going to be you know, left wanting. If you can't coordinate that with other instruments of national power, like diplomats, like aid workers, the intelligence community, um, then you're not really going to have the strategic effect that you want. Um, you know, IW campaigns are not likely to be decisive in and of themselves. Um, and so you still need that connectivity to the interagency, to other instruments of national power, even if they don't want to use the term IW. And I think that's okay. So I think, I think if, if you look at the operations and activities of irregular warfare as we're currently working to frame them in doctrine, um, and you look at the principles of an irregular approach, there is an inter interagency aspect to this that I think is critical to consider. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's something that we, we have underrepresented in our professional military education, in our training, in our leader development, and certainly in our doctrine. And so if, if we're going to move in this direction, which I think we fundamentally have to, to succeed in competition, uh, we have to frame uh, mechanisms that allow us to work more effectively with the interagency in competition because we don't want to bring the interagency in at the last minute in crisis or conflict. That, that depends on relationships. It depends on integration and liaison networks, the ability to work together and understand each other's cultures. We have to do that now in competition and we have to train, educate leaders uh, at Echelon in the joint force to better understand how to integrate the interagency. I think that's absolutely critical to, to succeeding. You know, any operation activity mission that is having the intended effects of irregular warfare, that, that idea that we are assuring partners or allies, we're coercing adversaries or other groups. Uh, if you're having that irregular effect, then the particular mission fits into an, an irregular warfare context. Yeah, so a couple thoughts on changes required to really truly inculcate irregular warfare into the Army and the Joint Force. I think first and foremost, you need doctrine, right? So we're working on that now. FM3 TAG 03 on uh, irregular warfare, this inaugural field manual for the Army to really explore deeply the operations and activities of irregular warfare and how they apply across the competition continuum. You have to have uh, doctrine. I think you have to look at training, probably a different way to do training, specifically some of the more the more technical and precise capabilities of the Joint Force and the Army and creating ranges with the authorities to properly apply, say, space and cyber operations in a training environment. Uh, we still struggle with multi-domain uh, ranges and capabilities and the authority to, quote unquote, pull a trigger and have a space effect, a cyber effect, an information effect, an electromagnetic effect to replicate some of these activities that we, were, we would conduct in irregular warfare campaigns. I think organizationally, it's probably worth uh, taking a look at how we structure uh, the joint force, the army, special operations to compete, but also to succeed and win in large scale combat operations. And those two formations may be different. They may not be structured exactly the same way. You can task organize, or you can develop a uh, force structure that is specific to competition and irregular warfare uh, as the primary approach, or you can focus on organizational structures that perhaps look at large-scale combat operations uh, with irregular warfare being uh, parallel or complementary to a conventional large-scale conflict. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's critical. I think education and PME is particularly important when it comes to irregular war. Why? Because I think for the force as a whole, the focus now is on conventional warfare. And uh, in order to preserve an ability and capabilities with regard to irregular war, you have to teach it and you have to, to create an awareness, especially in your, your leadership, uh, that, that allows them to know when they should shift and, 
uh, move over to a more irregular activities and how to conduct these activities, where to look for information, where to look for guidance, how to do that. When we finish the doctrine, uh, we're going to have to teach people about it. But it's really about making sure that the Army has the intellectual structure in place uh, for when the next time we get asked uh, to conduct uh, a regular warfare type operations somewhere. So it's our way of capturing the historical lessons learned and then having that, that playbook, that doctrinal playbook in place for when the Army needs it. And it's not just for uh, the units that are executing it, but it's, it's also uh, provide, well, is intended to provide an intellectual framework for Army senior leaders to engage with political leadership. You know, there's a Clausewitzian saying about the most important thing you need to understand is what type of war you're getting yourself into and then understanding that the war that you get yourself into may not be the war that it turns out to be. But I think what's most interesting to me is the application of irregular operations and activities in competition, specifically pre-conflict, across the competition continuum to shape the environment and prepare the environment for that crisis or conflict should it occur. Or if we do it correctly and we properly apply those irregular capabilities through irregular warfare approaches, we're actually deterring conflict, winning before we even have to fight a conventional conflict. There are a lot of things that our adversaries do uh, that we won't do, can't do, shouldn't do, that, that violate the laws of, of warfare, that violate the, the conduct expected of civilized nations. But there's an awful lot of room, I think, in particular in the information operation space, in, in the space space, um, and, and, and in, in the cyber world where the United States can use instruments of power short of military force that are going to change the battlefield, that are going to shape a future battlefield, that are going to win friends and influence people for the United States and make them less inclined to support the goals of our adversaries. And we have to understand that the joint force needs to provide a range of options. It can't just be satisfied you know, coming up with the, with the perfect vision of how we think we're defeating another military. Um, because I think at the end of the day, you know, policymakers that are making decisions on when we go to war want options. And I think, it, I think we're a little bit content to say, hey, I've got the perfect joint force solution to every single war fighting problem, but I think it's incumbent upon the services and, and the joint force to, to come up with that range of options which means developing IW capabilities that can be employed across a, a range of, of scenarios. It requires persistence. Uh, irregular effects are typically achieved over a long term. Uh, that's why we talk about campaigning to produce those effects. To other activities, they're producing peripheral dilemma. They are creating problems that the adversaries got to now think about and solve and distract them from, from other activities. Irregular effects can be achieved by employing capabilities across the joint force. Every service has capabilities that can produce these kinds of effects. It's not simply about the Army. It's not simply about the land force. It's not simply about special operations forces. But what matters is that to have success in these, you're almost always doing some sort of an integrated activity with a partner whether that is an interagency partner or a foreign partner, a partner nation or an allied nation, they're regular forces or sometimes even irregular forces that, that we are supporting and enabling. That's why uh, we have to be ready for it because it's the most likely form of conflict that the Army is going to be asked to do.